¿Cómo está? We, and we have Yuya. Um, by the way, we're still waiting for the uh, we're still waiting for the interpreters to show up. Uh, hola. Um, we the are session here. To, for everybody um, uh, in attendance session is going to be supposed to be multilingual. So um, I imagine Robert and Yuya will do it in English, and Eugenia, you do it in Spanish. Is that my? Is that? I will. I will do it in English, actually. Ah, okay, just to check, just making sure. Right. So everybody does it in English. So we're still going to get interpreters. Um, ah, we still have right. interpreter. Um, we have interpreters. So I will, in in any case, my presentation is in English, but I can answer questions in Spanish. I have no problem. Okay. Oh, yeah, that, that's perfect too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. All right. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay. So for people in the audience, uh, we have yeah, we have interpreters are here. Um, and they already select as interpreters. We need the, uh, yeah. Soon you will see the button for interpretation. It's not there, it's not there yet. Oh, you may see it. Um, I don't see it here in the uh, Zoom, however. So it's at the interpreters so here, Maria Jesus and Anneli are here the interpreters. Um, so yes, for people in the audience, you're welcome to ask questions in English or in Spanish. We have um, interpreters for that. Um, and if it, um, yeah, we, oh, let me just, uh, hold. am I, am I co-host? Oh, I, I, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a host yet. Um, I need to be, sorry, also need to be assigned as co-host. All right, so I already have hosting privileges, so let me just take care of this. Let's see if we haven't taken care of this already, uh, more. Don't have that. It has to be the. Uh... Yeah, I really, I really ask the host to take care of the interpreters. So, but so once again, while we fix that, um, soon you'll be able, um, folks in the audience will be able to see the interpretation buttons um, for uh, Spanish. And then once again, remember, everybody's welcome to ask questions in English or ask questions in Spanish um, to our presenters. Um, you're welcome to ask the questions in either language. Uh, the interpreters will be ready to assist and if, oh, if it comes to that so will i <laughs> i'll also be happy to assist with um translating the questions either way so i can i, I can also assist with that um my spanish is good enough to hold sooner to hold its own <laughs> um okay so it's almost time we, about we'll start about oh okay interpretation is really for everybody uh the, the interpretation button is available. Um, so you have options sources, English, Portuguese, and Spanish, but right now you just need to click on the ES for Spanish, for Espanol, uh, that one is available uh, for everybody who needs it. Um, so, and so once a second to... Um, Yeah, I'm fixing the issue. I think Pedro is right. Uh, just one second. I'm just fixing the issue. The both interpreters are English, Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, issues be, can we, yeah, yeah. Can we check? Is it working now? I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's yeah. I can see. The, I can see that the participants. They will said they will have the es um, the es sure. mark in their names. So we're good. Perfect. 
Thank you, Rahul. Thank you. Thank right. you, Rahul. No problem. Uh, happy to assist. Okay, so it's 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 three uh, it's three thirty my my time four thirty Eastern and something thirty everywhere else in the world. Uh, so uh, good afternoon and buenas tardes to everybody out there in the crowd. Um, Raúl Alberto Mora broadcasting today from Medellín, uh, a land ancestrally under the care of the Embera, the Senu, and the Kunatule Indigenous Nations. And I'm very happy to be your host for this afternoon uh, from what seems looking at the looking at the um, at the titles of the sessions be a very intriguing uh, and exciting session. We have three papers. I'll introduce them right away and then we'll just let them flow um, as they go with their introduction with our presentations. First, we're gonna have Robert Carley presenting politically allied critical pedagogies. Antonio Gramsci, Autonomous and Anarchist Approaches. The title seems still in, it's, it's, it's mouth-watering, definitely. Um, second one by Eugenia Carrion, uh, ELT as a Political Act, A Través de la Lengua, La Enseñanza del Inglés como Acto Político. Political. I'm, I'm excited as a language teacher, I'm excited to hear what uh, you're gonna say today, Eugenia. And finally, we have Yuya Takeda from Japan talking about on the insufficiency of facts, critical media literacy about conspiracy theories. So I see three very ex exciting sessions um, that will give us lots to think about. So the way we can do it is each of you will go into the presentation with your five minutes of um, presentation. And after that, we'll open the floor for the conversation uh, whether you have questions you want us to reflect on or the audience has questions they want to address to each or all of the presenters. Once again, with a reminder that we have interpretation services in Spanish and in English, and everybody in the room are welcome to address your questions to the presenters in either la in the language you feel most comfortable in. Uh, and then we'll proceed as we go. And that should be the last you hear from me for the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, let's all get ready for what's gonna be a really interesting session and we'll go into the program. So Robert, uh, the floor is yours for the first presentation. Thanks, I'm gonna read. Uh, I come right in at five minutes and I'll throw my questions in the chat, the five questions. So in these five minutes, I wanna argue that critical pedagogy happens outside of the classroom. And critical pedagogies matter to the extent that they organize their relationship with and to these external spaces, which I call political organizational pedagogy. In the left hemisphere, mapping critical theory today, Ramzi Kuchuyan describes the task of critical theory. He states that a new critical theory is a theory, not merely an analysis or interpretation. It not only reflects on what is, it also raises the issue of what is desirable. The aim of a critical pedagogy must be similar. It has to effectively describe and provide room for reflection about the social world and its expressive political and cultural forms. It has to provide foundations for the analysis of culture, society, and politics, but most importantly, it has to either locate or construct places to which the theory may go subsequent to analysis. So I'm gonna make a few points. First, the university as an institution is embedded in broader sets of structural and political relationships. Critical pedagogy must marshal an institutional analysis or an analysis internal to the institutional formations alongside of a broader political economy based analysis or an analysis of the social formation. To activate this analysis requires recognizing that critical pedagogy's sole place isn't in the classroom. Raising the issue of what is desirable at times fails to include its necessary corollary, a political project or strategy. Second, in their survey of the field of critical pedagogy, Villanueva and O'Sullivan state that, quote, it is possible to distinguish two main groups, those who understand praxis as an action within the classroom and those who believe it should transcend it. So third point, these groups need to be specified to understand the scope of praxis in the context of critical pedagogy. I argue for a big tent, a broad political praxeological scope broad and varied enough to cover what happens outside of the classroom and institutions of higher learning entirely. Activist pedagogy, party pedagogy, or broadly political organizational pedagogy. If forms of pedagogy already exist in the space that critical pedagogues in the institutional frameworks of higher education hope to transcend towards, 
then the work of critical pedagogy should be viewed as a meeting point between what goes on inside of the classroom and what happens outside of it. So I'm gonna give some examples of what I'm talking about. Francis Dupuy Derry in discussing the beginnings of anarchist affinity groups explains how, quote, in the Spain of 1970s and 19, I'm sorry, 1870s and 1880s, grupos de affinidad or terutiles gathered together in cafes to debate ideas, to prepare future actions and to share news. Reading newspapers aloud was an important practice due to the high rate of illiteracy. In short, affinity groups take a specified and concrete cultural form and practice that at its inception is developmental involving communication and debate and pragmatic involving information and literacy strategy and planning. Similarly, Antonio Gramsci's involvement with the Socialist Party during the Factory Council movement, Gramsci there was able to integrate cultural education with economic action towards political change through cultural associations where workers outside of the factories and council movement would socialize, find entertainment and receive information and education. This provided an opportunity to link organizationally the factory council movement through political education to the broader wave of contention leading to the Bien Oroso or two red years. Both examples are critical pedagogical practices, a process of developing communal or collective contexts that amplify the abilities of individuals to participate in critical and reflective contexts and bring them to fruition. Last, in Black Block White Riot, A.K. Thompson describes how students during their occupation of the president's office at the University of Guelph, changed their strategic preparation and the tactics associated with it. For activists involved in the occupation, the conceptual terrain of authoritative threat, specifically after failing to remove activists by force, the university police asked that they not look in the filing cabinets, exposed the more durable terrain of organizational vulnerabilities that would be pertinent to administrative spaces in other institutional frameworks. The students in this case produce knowledge through direct action through social protest. Thompson's work explores the critical pedagogic function through an entirely new epistemological lens. Direct action produces knowledge and reflection alongside of new strategies and tactics. In closing, Mary Brunig conducted a qualitative, an qualitative analysis of critical pedagogical practices. Interview data from the study demonstrated that instructors were more likely to teach about the idea of critical pedagogy. Brunig states that, quote, overall, the results from my study point to the need for critical pedagogy to work towards better explication and communication of its social justice orientation alongside of its constructivist orientation. There may still be some work that needs to be done to encourage ed educators to recognize that critical pedagogical praxis must go beyond a set of teaching techniques and attend to the political, social, and economic factors that have conspired to marginalize people in the first place. And these are my questions. I'm going to throw them in the chat. Oh, it's only going to one person. I, it, I don't know. It doesn't have to all. So hopefully you can all see this. And if not, I'll see if I can find to all. But I'm, I'm finished. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, I will do my best to. Stick to the five minutes. I will share my screen. Let's see if I can't. Yes. Okay. Please let me know if you can all see my presentation. Great, fantastic. So the name of my presentation is Through the Language Glass, ELT is a Political Act. And first of all, I would like to say that I got the inspiration for this um, talk by three authors that are very important for me. The, four, the first one is J.J. Wilson, that is an English scholar, and also the author of the, the novel Damnificados. Also, of course, Luis Caro, right? the, the author of Alice in Wonderland, and uh, Graciela Frigerio, that is the Argentinian educator, that is a very well-known Argentinian educator, that is the author, among many others, of the book Educar ese acto politico. All of them, um, academically recognized and politically committed. So first of all, I will introduce myself. As Raul said, my name is Eugenia Carrion Canton. And the first thing that I would like to say about me is I come from a place of privilege. I am an only child raised in a middle-class family who gave all the, who, who was given all the opportunities to succeed in life. My parents thought that by learning English, um, English would be like an open door 
for my life and, and that it would solve all my problems. And I have to say that they were right. I am a proud graduated student from the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba who share the passion for English uh, language teaching. But also I felt like a fish out of the water because my concerns related to education in, uh, the, let's say, in the arena of the foreign language teaching were different from the ones for my former classmates um, who insisted on keeping the access to knowledge just for a few. Um, so everything changed in 2010 when I started working at IPES Paulo Freire as a director of studies as an English program. Um, my boss at that time, the first dean of IPES Paulo Freire, um, said very intensively, no entrance exams or placement tests for the English program. And that really blew my mind. It was um, at that moment that uh, she, she says that, how, what, how was it that if students at secondary school had English, similarly to biology or to math, they needed an extra preparation for entering uh, the teaching training college in terms of uh, teaching English as a foreign language. And I said before, that really blew my mind. And I discovered there the difference between being an English teacher and become an educator who teaches English. Of course, also the importance of the democratization of access of knowledge in terms of ELT. And of course, I discovered Paulo Freire at that time. The first book I encountered was letters from those who they are teach. And well, I discovered that he was a radical and that he uh, believed that the basis of education was related to love, love to the world, love to human and life, love to uh, nature. Basically understanding love as social justice. Um, of course, some of the main concepts that you can see there is coming that he opposed to the, the banking concept of education. He based uh, his, his pedagogy in problem solving, in questioning, and in the belief of the transforming world. So I posed three questions that for me were crucial in relation to, uh, let's say, um, focus on the, or, or relate, right, the issues about how to teach English, right, in this frame of, of Freire and pedagogy. So the questions were, what is social justice? What is the relationship between social justice and ELT? And how are EFL teachers qualified to social justice in the classroom? So as you can see here, well, the notion, right, social justice as the notion that all people in society deserve fair and equitable rights, opportunities, and access to resources. Social justice should be part of the mission of every educator at school. And, right, it is related to the development of some skills, right, that contribute to the ability of developing this work for social justice, like problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, of course, and persevering. Uh, and it depends on the role of teachers in society. In Argentina specifically, right, the law of education demands from educators a multidimensional and including, uh, inclusive, sorry, paradigms. That is, that means that the teaching of English as a foreign language is related to the access of learning, the intercultural access, and also to the one related to citizenship. So teachers model social justice in the classroom. And as you can see there, these are some examples of different events in which uh, teachers and students from the English program at the teacher, is, let's say, uh, IPES Paulo Freire uh, education programs participated. So uh, teaching social justice in the classroom is not a body of knowledge, but it is an approach to materials, to students, to roles, to, sorry, to rules, to, to norms, to technology. And the question there would be, what might social justice issues would look like in the classroom? So, in my opinion, this can be tackled uh, by means of three, um, let's say, contexts, the arts and literature, 
and community projects. As you can see there, right, considering the, um, let's say, the frame of identity and inclusion, we intervene some local paintings, right, with some poetry uh, that was relevant to the context of uh, Argentinian students, right, in English and in Spanish. These are just mere examples of that to share and to, to start talking about this issue. And also some community projects. Uh, as regards community projects, it is very important to consider, well, I selected one that is a, a very interesting one that is English through gamification. There was a specific pro project that students at the pre-service instance, um, uh, I mean, went through, right, uh, together with the town hall, teaching English to the community with, uh, let's say, the frame of gamification. Uh, also mentoring, and this uh, is related to, uh, let's say, collaborating or working together with students in the collaborative writing of papers, uh, let's say, uh, presenting together with students at different conferences and involving them into the academic world. And also another example there, as you can see, is SEDI, that is uh, the English language, I mean, the language for the community. Ipes Paulo Freire has a department that is a volunteering department in which teachers and pre-service students develop uh, the teaching of, in, of English, Italian, French, and Portuguese as a foreign language to the community for free. These are just some examples, right, to, to see, right, in which ways uh, social justice can be developed in the teaching of English as a foreign language. So I believe that it is high time that we look through the language class, right? Um, to discover the dimension that foreign language teaching has to empower our students to stand for their opinions, to talk about current issues, and of course, to take action and in the end, to transform the world. That is what we are, what we are here for, right? So just to finish, I would like to share with you this quote by Eduardo Galeano, that is in Spanish, but is an Uruguayan uh, author, that is, when it is genuine, when it is born of the need to speak, no one can stop the human voice. When denied a mouth, it speaks with the hands or the eyes or the pores or anything at all, because every single one of us has something to say to us, to the others, something that deserves to celebrate or to, forbid, to be forbidden by others. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope my position is clear enough. Wonderful. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. All right. All right. Are you seeing the slides? Great. Um, sorry, I'm yeah, such an idiot. Sorry, sorry. Huh. You, you, we're actually seeing we're seeing the up we're seeing the presenter side, not the uh, not, oh, yo, not yo, the... Yo, yo. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. How about now? Still presenter side? Is it okay? It's perfect yeah. now. It's perfect it's now, yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm such an idiot. I, I completely misunderstood the format and uh, I prepared my presentation for 15 minutes um, and I recorded one. Uh, so if you're interested, there's a full presentation I can share um, on the chat screen, but I'll try to be um, within five minutes. Um, my name is Yuya Takeda. I'm um, in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is situated in the traditional unceded territory of Coast Salish people. Um, my, uh, this is, um, uh, part of my dissertation project, and um, in it, I'm claiming that um, I'm kind of pr proposing an antithesis to the over-reliance on scientific facts and objectivity to counter the so-called post-truth condition in media literacy education. Um, and for this, I uh, study uh, conspiracy theories and um, um, 
my starting point of this study is this. So although there's no unitary approach um, to critical literacy, the four, there are four dimensions um, of critical literacy delineated by Louis Sun Flint and Van Slice. Uh, this captures the uh, central tenets of critical literacy, which include uh, disrupting the commonplace, interrogating multiple viewpoints, focusing on social political issues, taking action, and promoting social justice. Here are some quotes from, uh, uh, from and description of participants in a sociological study that seem to resonate with the four dimensions of critical literacy. Um, virtually all respondents emphasize how they don't have and roll on the ground waves of society, but instead are a skeptic by nature, dare to think differently, think out of the box and put question marks over nearly everything. Um, he's able to convince his audience and acquire epistemic authority precisely because he's able to deploy a very diverse range of epistemic strategies from the spiritual to the social scientific and from the visceral to the cerebral. Um, I've always had a desire for freedom. So when you find that certain systems, be they work or school or what have you are oppressive, you start looking for something that liberates you and how that, that's how I came here. It is up to the people and the critical thinkers, it is up to the people who resist and long for change uh, to finally unite with each other and actually start taking actions because if everyone would indeed remain passive, you will hold back that change. Um, I think you already know what I'm getting at. These quotes, are from a book titled Contemporary Conspiracy Culture. And the researcher Jaron Haramban is describing quoting the people who belong to the culture of conspiracy theories. However superficial, I'm struck by the apparent similarity between the disposition critical literacy education aims to cultivate and what conspiracy theorists claim to embody. So this is the starting point of um, my in, uh, research, uh, the apparent similarities between critical media literacy and uh, conspiracy theories. So in my project, I analyzed the YouTube videos that aim to educate public about conspiracy theories and identify the ways in which conspiracy theories are constructed in educational discourses. Um, and I used a thematic and discourse analysis and I found a prom one of the prominent themes uh, of those um, discourses that emphasis on the scientific facts, um, and uh, we need to regain the trust in science, uh, scientists, experts, and so on. Um, this is a quote from a, a video uh, produced by Vice. Uh, it states, calling scientists liars is a cornerstone of most conspiracies. But the problem is that we need to trust in scientists because when you tear up the very basis of truth, you can start to believe in anything. If you don't believe in science, very bad, powerful people with lots of money get to claim whatever they want. So while the argument is about how excessive relativism creates a situation where financially powerful people get to push their version of truth, regarding science as the very basis of truth is quite intriguing. It seems to be equalizing scientific facts and truth and attributing science the sole epistemic authority in defining truth. And similar arguments are made by um, media literacy scholars. Um, for example, Colin Barton uh, lamenting the truth being a relative concept rather than scientific one. He says, um, what is key in both critical consciousness and critical media literacy from an epistemological sense is evaluation and judgment formulated by objective analysis. So here again, the emphasis on objective facts uh, are prominent. And uh, in my paper, I uh, philosophically investigate on the concept of meaning and what it is. Um, I'm kind of uh, going through quickly, but um, Japanese philosopher Seiji Takeda argues that meaning is a fundamentally existential concept. So for example, um, in reflecting on the everyday usage of meaning, some may say meaning is a descriptive concept that associates one entity with others. So the quintessential example of which is dictionary. However, when we experience something that's meaningful, there seems to be much more than a simple association of A with B. So for example, meaningfulness of a clock is 
felt when a particular clock is a gift from someone important or one is presenting a 4,000 uh, word paper within five minutes. <laughs> um, and um, so that's important point. Uh, meaning is an existential phenomenon. And me, uh, uh, both Takeda Seiji and the Czech philosopher Jan Patochka agrees that the meaning and value are fundamentally uh, the same concept or inseparable concepts. Okay. And I differentiate that with um, uh, uh, facts. And facts is commonly understood in contrast with value. And the methodologies and technologies of modern science systematically eliminate subjective elements in elucidating their objects of investigation. Um, in the crisis of European sciences, uh, Edmund Husserl argues that the essence of modern science is the mathematization of nature. And through mathematical praxis, Husserl writes, we attain what is denied us in empirical praxis, exactness, for there's the possibility of determining the ideal shapes in absolute identity of recognizing them as substrates of absolutely identical and method methodically univocally determinable qualities. So mathematics denotes, um, it removes the polysemy of concepts um, and what mathematical uh, symbols denote is the orderly distributed numbers with equal intervals and um, they denote only this distance between each sign. So that's why it attains um, exactness. Um, and this mathematical, mathematization of nature, not only um, um, turning nature into calculable objects, but our senses of reality and our places in it are influenced by this uh, paradigm of science. Um, Hannah Arendt uh, critiques the idea of um, uh, science um, uh, and um, how it disable us to speak, um, speak with one another, um, but I'll skip here. Um, to concretize my argument, um, I discuss conspiracy theories as a textual genre that demand our treatment as matters of concern. And conspiracy theories is defined as an explanation of historical ongoing or future events that cites as a main causal factor, a small group of powerful persons, the conspirators acting in secret for their own benefit against the common good. Um, three characteristics of conspiracy theories is nothing happens by accident, nothing as it seems, and everything is connected. And assumptions as these, Alpers and Haramban says, are manifestation of ultimate meaning making, they can be understood as self-constructed theodicies explaining evil and suffering of the world. So conspiracy theories are powerful meaning bestowing device uh, uh, with Manichean dichotomy of good and evil. Um, uh, uh, philosopher Karl Popper argues that um, conspiracy theories became popular uh, when during the enlightenment and the so-called um, um, disenchantment of the world. Um, so it, conspiracy theories replace the position of God and uh, giving meaning um, to things. Um, so Alpers and Haramban argues that conspiracy theories as rational enchantments, and uh, the, uh, they are associated with esotericism, new age spirituality, social constructivism, critical theories, and so on. And this hodgepodge of spirituality and social scientific theories mystify the modern society. And unlike modern science's revelation of what things are, conspiracy theorists seek to find what they mean. Um, so no matter how spurious they seem, rational debunking through presentation of facts is not an effective approach to um, make believers rethink their position. Um, and uh, Talman argues that um, more often than not, conspiracy theorists thus take the stigmatization of conspiracy theory, the debunking or blocking of conspiracist contents as evidence of the bias exhibited by the mainstream media, or even as a sign of that media too are part of an elite conspiracy. So this um, debunking itself, it's seen as a sign <laughs> uh, of the 
conspiracies behind it. So my argument is that um, given the centrality of meaning in conspiracy theorists' ideas, um, presentation of facts is not enough. And literacy education, and I see literacy as a participation in meaning making, so literacy education can play a significant role in it in discussing uh, conspiracy theories that are, goes beyond the, the um, emphasis on objective facts. Um, and um, although, although Freire doesn't um, talk about the distinction between meaning and facts, his idea of subjectivity and objectivity in dialectic highly resonates uh, with the arguments I'm making here. Um, so I, I argue that an important task for literacy education is to provide a space to learn about our tendency to desire certainty and abilities to own meanings without relying on external forces that provide the ultimate framework for meaning. Uh, what Jan Patochka says is insightful here. The result of the primordial shaking of accepted meaning is not a full into meaninglessness, but on the contrary, the discovery of the possibility of achieving a freer, more demanding meaningfulness. So what literacy education can offer is not a stable ground for meaning, but it's openness. The form of meaningfulness is both freer and more demanding because it is about actualization of positive freedom. We are not free to give meanings to the entities in the world, whatever we, we please. As Freire says, it must be mediated by the world. Um, to live meaningfully in a common world is to enter the world that is inhibited by others prior to one's arrival. Thus, participation in meaning making involves negotiations against the background of norms where one needs to offer a meaning one has thought through, seeking reasons and accepting responsibility for it. That's um, Jan Patochka. Rather than outsourcing the ground for meaning, one's commitment and responsibility becomes the source of meaningful life. So um, because of my, uh, uh, sorry. So because of my misunderstanding of the format, I didn't uh, prepare a neat uh, discussion questions, but uh, let me, uh, I, I'll write down these, but um, I pose these questions. How do we demarcate? How do we say this is a form of critical literacy that is desirable for us to, uh, for learners to cultivate and uh, things that are not so desirable. So um, it's um, about the striking similarities, apparent similarities between conspiracy theories and critical media literacy. How do we distinguish them? Um, the other is um, if we are to take meaning um, as the central point for literacy education, um, what can we do uh, as educators to teach learners about the commitment and responsibilities involved in the participation in meaning making. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you for these um, incredibly provocative uh, sessions. I, I, I see a lot of things I can see. I see a lot of similar, I see a lot of overlap even in my own work with each of you and the case of Robert. Uh, the, the Gramscian perspective, and one that I, I've used in my own research of Carter Hegemony, uh, the work with Eugenia, even so the pictures, we have a few common friends and some topics of common interest. And you yeah, know some of your work on critical literacy, so I already know the overlaps. So I, um, I would love to, to have uh, the audience get engaged in the conversation. Um, uh, Robert already threw us some questions um, in the uh, in the chat so we can start with that if people want to jump in and provide oh we already have a hand raised so I'm going to stop talking so Jennifer please go for it hi um, thank you so much for everybody who's been organizing this conference and this session um, I so I'm Jennifer Posner. I'm, I do critical media literacy education as a writer and as I do workshops. I'm not in, based in a school. Um, 
I've done books. And so right now I'm working on a, the script for a graphic novel on criti critical media literacy. And the one chapter that I am dreading the absolute most writing is on disinformation. And so uh, Yuya, I, I don't know if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah. um, I, I was fascinated by your presentation. I'm definitely going to look at the whole thing. Um, I guess, and this, feel free to say it's too complicated a question to answer in this space, um, or maybe we could follow up after. But if you, I was wondering, um, considering the, the word, the, the fact that graphic novels are constrained by very few words, um, what do you consider uh, for a non-academic audience, for a general interest audience, the most important things people need to understand about conspiracy theories, about disinformation? If I was going to leave out something, what should I not leave out? You know, because I'm there's a million ways to go. Um, I'm planning my one basic deep dive example is going to be on COVID and misinformation around misinformation and disinformation around the pandemic. Um, but I'm wondering if in your research you've come across ideas that are um, the most helpful or the least helpful, the, le the most alienating, the least alienating to get people to understand since what you said really stood out about how um, facts can reify the conspiracy theory itself. So how do you get around that? So um, one of the important um, things to talk about is the distinction between so-called fake news and uh, uh, conspiracy theories. While the former is um, um, deliberate disinformation um, to this, uh, to disseminate um, information that are not true. Um, and the conspiracy theories are often uh, claimed by the, the genuine believers of those theories. Uh, so there's a distinction between uh, fake news and uh, conspiracy theories. And it's kind of like related to the, the, the distinction between disinformation uh, and misinformation. Um, but starting with there, because um, Conspiracy theories and fake news are discussed under the umbrella of post-truth, um, but those are um, somewhat similar but different genres of texts, and some of them overlap and so on. Um, and my position is that if the believers of conspiracy theories seem to have this existential commitment on uh, certain theories and beliefs they have, um, so the critique of that idea is interpreted as the critique of their identity itself. Um, how do we, so at some of the, the educational messages talk about the social needs or um, more socio emotional supports that are uh, necessarily um, in kind of slowly uh, persuading the, the believers of those theories um, to think otherwise. So um, complex things, let me say two more things. One is that, yes, so that's, um, it's the socio-emotional support that maybe uh, that should come up as a primary thing. Uh, and the, rather than directly confronting the idea, listen. Uh, to the person and um, because I think it's often the um, non-presence of others that are the, the kind of like a rigid, stiff form of belief. So inserting presence of others is one step. And another thing is that it's important to recognize that there have been uh, actual conspiracies in the history. Uh, so a Watergate scandal or Tuskegee uh, syphilis ex experiments and conspiracy theories may have an important role to play in the society. So just but because something looks conspiratorial or conspiracy, uh, has an appearance of conspiracy theories, labeling some ideas as conspiracy theories to, dis, uh, to discard it may not be a good approach. So um, those two. Um, is what I can think of uh, right away. That's a great, idea. one of the things I was thinking about using was um, COINTELPRO, all the tactics of COINTELPRO were considered conspiracy until it came out that it was true. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for those interesting. I think uh, they prompted a lot of uh, thoughts uh, from, from three presentations. And um, I think this, this question is really connected to all three. I'm kind of uh, the emergent thoughts from the three, the three, three conversations that were being had. Um, and I just really, the last idea that Robert mentioned was really the, this idea that we can't separate critical media literacy from the social political environment that the you know the this this, this critical engagement is reflective of, of of the social political environment and then eugenia the, then thinking about you know um, who access to elt and sort of um instruction in, in what's privileged um and how you know access to opportunities come about and then really thinking about this in the context of critical media literacies and and, and uh, in conspiracy theories so then my question is this if you come to you know this 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 idea that um, if we think about alternative facts or knowledge as being a process by which um, those that don't have maybe privilege and are seeking to gain some kind of representation in the political sphere, how do you determine? Um, and I'm sorry if my question isn't uh, isn't well well formulated, and I'm, I'm trying to think through these ideas. How do you, on the one hand, privilege voices and 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 understand voices that haven't been included in the public sphere and haven't been included in in dominant discourses, and identify and sort of in the context that you know this relative um, the relativism of truth and and sort of you know, the, the, uh, and, and that perspective that, that um, uh, you, you, you was mentioning. How do you then realize the understanding of non-privileged voices while at the time, same time discerning whether they're identified as, 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 um, as, as conspiracy theories? So maybe what was my point is really, are conspiracy theories a way in which non-privileged voices can gain um, a, 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 a representation, and if that's not the case, and if we're if we're saying truth is relative, how do we then come about with a way in which non-privileged voices do gain um, representation, whilst at the same time not um, not not then defining them as as as, as false or misinformation and things like that. I'm sorry if that question isn't well well formulated. There is an idea behind it, um, but I'm still working through coming up with how to specifically describe it. Do you, does, I can jump in if it's all right with everyone. I don't wanna, okay. So I, I, that's a great question. And I, I actually, I agree with, with the premise behind the question. I do think that um, and it, this really ties into what Yuya was talking about, which is that um, we need to think about the relationship between conspiracy theories and a uh, larger existential question, which is to say, and this is also in, in your question, Ash, the idea that um, these conspiracy theories are linked to, in certain contexts or in certain cases, they're linked to people's identities and they're sort of, um, they, ex they express or represent a position they express or represent um, a, a particular sort of um, a, a sort of a body of interests that 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 are not necessarily linked to the individual espousing the conspiracy theories. And so, I want to take that further, which is to say that there's certainly conspiratorial discourses circulating, right? And and for me, I often think about these things concretely, right? Which is to say that in this conjuncture, in this moment, there are people who I think um, are exist within political communities. And those political communities are staked precisely on particular conspiracy theories, right? So the capital riots would be one. And certainly these things overlap, but we can sort of identify other groups as well, um, you know, who are espousing um, uh, their, conspir their conspiratorial framework through, for example, white supremacy, right? So I think there are movements that that are really embedded, that they, they are embedded existentially in these conspiracy theories, right? We, I mean, you know, there are identity movements, regressive identity movements. And then there are people who cleave to those discourses who may not, right, have that sort of existential connection 
but may repeat the discourse. I think these people can be convinced otherwise, which is why for me and in my presentation, I think this is a political question fundamentally, right? Um, what, I, what I talk about in, in a book I recently wrote is, which is based very strongly in Gramsci's idea, is from out of his categories of intellectuals, I mine this idea of a conjunctural intellectual. In other words, an intellectual that is sort of top-down opportunist, and when the moment shifts, they're gone. Milo Yiannopoulos is a great case of this. We don't hear from him anymore, right? He's been discredited and the conjuncture shifting, right? So I think like there's this idea that um, these things, um, and, and I think that in some cases, conspiracy theories uh, could be associated with this. They lose traction if something changes, right? Which isn't to say people don't hold those ideas anymore but it is to say that those ideas don't have the sort of purchase they might have within frameworks like media frameworks, right? Um, so I think that's sort of important to think about is that distinction between those who are embedded in movements that are producing a conspiratorial framework because they're linked fundamentally to their identity. So that link is existential and those who reproduce the discourse but, but can be convinced otherwise. Just to add to what Robert mentioned, right? I would say that for teacher education, it is very important to um, to make space for all possibilities and to expand, to go further the dominant voices, especially in I mean, uh, in terms of what teaching, uh, let's say, in, in the ELT world, right, in which I am immersed. That is something we have to, to struggle against all the time, just to not to lose track on, on issues related to identity and to the, let's say, the reasons for becoming a teacher of, in this case, uh, uh, English as a foreign language, right? There is a, a, a great concern in, in Latin American countries uh, in, in the access of students into the ELT world. Right and the possibilities of them to to succeed right as professionals of English as a foreign language in this case, but in 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 the in the world of teacher education, this is very important in terms of the initial formation. I would say right to to become a professional of the education that is committed to our own reality. And as Freire says uh, uh, all the time, right, to bring what the students have in their own context to the te as, as a teaching experience, right? Democratizing, right, um, I, I would say um, media uh, and many other expressions, right, that contribute to that initial formation, right? And to make this awareness, as my colleagues mentioned, that it is very important to, to reflect upon literacy and, and, and critical media literacy, of course, as well as the importance of the political position as an educator. That does not mean just to provide, uh, let's say, one, uh, one, only one perspective right, of situations, but yes, the obligation and the responsibility to broaden the scope and to provide all voices, not only the dominant ones, uh, on this display of teaching experience, I would say. Thank you. Uh, my sorry, my uh, then I'll, I'll uh, thank you. I'll, I um, my quick response is um, um, I think the recognition of history history of oppression is important i think some groups um of people who come to believe in certain um stigmatized forms of knowledge um have reasons uh why they arrive at this uh radical distrust or uh immense skepticism toward the mainstream institutions. Um, so recognition of that history, I think, is important. And um, this, some studies show that um, the, the, some of the th theories or ideas coming from, say, Black community or uh, Islam community, Muslim community, tend to be labeled as conspiracy theories uh, more than some other ideas. Um, so there is um, um, 
cautionally lying there. Uh, so recognition of history, uh, that's, I, I just stop there for now. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for a um, great series of presentations. Um, and this has been great. Um, so I clear some topics I'm interested in. I, I guess I have um, two questions, maybe as, as points of um, discussion and, and clarification. I'll put them, put them together as one and you can decide, I guess, how to answer them. But um, one is, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the connection between the secrecy and failure of elites um, to the proliferation of baseless or false conspiracies. And then um, secondly, um, this is kind of a, a pet peeve of mine, so I want to hear you speak to it. Um, I, I don't like to, I like to say fake news doesn't necessarily have to be intended to be fake, because I think that lets journalists off the hook for making huge errors that are then um, proliferated throughout our, our media ecosystems. So I kind of wonder if you could speak to the, those two um, those two issues. If anything you guys can share is great. And again, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Sorry, could you repeat the first question? I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, I think the connection between the, the secrecy and and or failure of elites with the proliferation yeah, 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 yeah. of baseless yeah, yeah. false conspiracies. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, it's it's certainly uh, um, a transparency is a, a big issue. Uh, so, for example, um, during the uh, triple disasters um, in Japan uh, uh, after the uh, the nuclear power plant plants uh, Fukushima explosion, um, there were a lot of conspiracy theories came out out of it um, too, um, and it is. Kind of, I think from my standpoint, it is totally justifiable that people who were concerned and um, the um, government wasn't, it was clear that government wasn't totally transparent about their practices and so on. So, um, and some cases, I think conspiracy theories coming out of um, this lack of transparency might push the officials uh, to reveal, uh, gain a transparency in certain uh, sharing of information. Uh, so that, I don't know, that, that might be that function too. Uh, so yes, transparency, it, it's a, a big um, component. And I agree with you about the uh, uh, fake news, um, sometimes not deliver it, um, but it's more of a hook. Um, sensationalization of uh, news and so on. Um, so yeah, the recognition of that, the constructedness and uh, the kind of like a market, how the mar news as an industry operates uh, is an important element for us to teach as well. Um, Do any of the other presenters want to jump in and say and comment on Nolan's question? Or if not, otherwise, I um, really would like to address the question that Neil left in the, um, in the chat. Uh, I know Robert commented, but I would like you to elaborate uh, once, I give, once I open the microphones. The question says, so is there a class slash educational quality to conspiracy theory users? Um, so really now I'll, I'll, I'll shut off again and you are welcome to go at it. My take is that um, it's not, so conspiracy theories haven't been a much foregrounded conversation in educational discourses yet. Um, it, it, probably because of the, the foregrounding of it in the public discourses in the past year uh, for obvious reasons. Um, there'll be more conversations in education. Um, but I think one of the, uh, the concerns is that talking about conspiracy theories may seem as an endorsement of those ideas uh, in classrooms. Um, so I think that's a, a, um, something to be avoided, I think. Um, my position is that it's not the... Um, Critic conspiracy theories themselves that are educational, but 
it tells us about, say, two things. One is that a lot of uh, critical theories that we teach can be used or abused uh, to claim certain things that are damaging to the society. Uh, French uh, philosopher Bruno Latour has an article called uh, Why Has the Critique Run Out of the Steam? Uh, in it, he says this may be critical uh, conspiracy theories or um, deformation of cons uh, what we think as critical theories. And, um, and those techniques are used by the, the climate change deniers and so on. So recognition of um, conceptual tools can be abused. Uh, that possibility is an educational, uh, I think, element. And another thing is, uh, again, about our tendency for to desire certainty and um, sort of external meaning that uh, guide our lives. Um, and um, and probably our needs to um, take responsibilities of our uh, meaning and so on. So uh, to, to me, talking about conspiracy theories in educational context is uh, mainly in those two aspects. Uh, Robert or Eugenia, you want, uh, want to jump in and make a comment or? I, yeah, I can. I, I, I think I wanted to just respond directly to the, um, the, the class educational quality. Um, I think, um, you know, I think that needs to be, I think, a, I think the context is really important, right? One of the things that um, I would often hear repeated uh, over and over again um, in, with regard to um, people who are prone to espousing conspiracy theories um, uh, and that uh, in support of, of, of Donald Trump was that they were the white working class. In fact, they were the white petty bourgeoisie. They were business owners, right? And I think that's really important, um, which is to say that they may or may not have been educated um, uh, um, in, in a formal way, they may have been. But I think that um, in, in certain contexts, um, a conspiracy theory is a really useful instrument, right? I mean, there was nothing really done, if anything, they're quite the opposite, right? Um, to uh, um, stop conspiracy theories from circulating from 2016 to 2020 in the United States, right? Which is because they, they were a useful political instrument without question, um, which is to say that whether or not people were who were educated or um, who were uh, with, with infractions of um, you know, the capitalist class believed in those theories or not, those theories were useful, right? Uh, and so I think that, that that's sort of like, an, that's, that's kind of an important point about, about conspiracy theories. I, I think that um, they have, if they have political utility, then you know, um, they, uh, they, they, I don't wanna say they transcend classes, I wanna say they organize them around a particular political issue. Oh, okay, so just to to add a line to what Robert mentioned, I think that the role of educators in that case is crucial uh, in order to deconstruct this naturalization of ideas in relation to the social status, uh, right, on this um, historical contextualization of beliefs in terms of this relationship to cultural groups, um, a historical context, and also, um, let's say, the, the, the political positions. So that's, uh, I mean, my position towards education is related to that, to make awareness, to raise awareness onto the teacher education, um, let's say, uh, frame, right? Especially an in initial educa education of, of the, the importance of, um, let's say, uh, helping students or pre-service students into analyzing, right, the power, right, of uh, education into naturalizing or deconstructing this perspective, right? Uh, thank you all. And now I think Alicia, we're gonna give you the last question before this uh, panel closes, so go for it. Trataré de ser breve. Eh, tiene relación un poco con el planteo educativo de Eugenia Carrión cuando 
planteó que tuvo que romper su paradigma y su matriz de formación estructurada respecto de la enseñanza del inglés. Y a esto voy a sumarle que en Argentina, por ejemplo, como en otros países latinoamericanos, hay editoriales multinacionales que se instalan y prescriben contenidos curriculares eh, y tuvimos que romper eso y, y la resistencia fue enorme. Eugenia puede explicar esa experiencia. Eh, los profesores de inglés tuvieron mm, enojo, el rechazo al principio, pero luego eh, Eugenia pudo desarrollar la cuestión del contexto es fundamental. La cultura, hay que partir desde la cultura propia para hacer este tipo de comprensiones. Y además, un, una prescripción curricular que eh, no solamente muestra el saber para aprender o el contenido de enseñanza, sino eh, que está planteado de, desde un paradigma, no permite al estudiante ser crítico respecto de por qué se enseña esto primero, esto después y esto al final. Entonces, el planteo nuestro fue que nuestros ah. estudiantes pudieran construir ah. sus propias propuestas pedagógicas contextualizadas a la realidad local para enseñar el inglés. Por supuesto que está el espacio de cultura inglesa, pero es importante partir desde lo conocido. Eh, recuerdo Maipago, Eugenia, eh, una experiencia también de Lipes, y creo que es, eh, se relaciona mucho con, con esta cuestión de las teorías conspirativas. Los más pequeños, desde eh, que comienzan la educación formal a través de la literatura, eh, se puede comenzar a enseñar, a reponer el contexto que no está explícito en un cuento. Caperucita Roja, el más tradicional de los cuentos, plantea múltiples mensajes que no están explicitados. Y hay que comenzar con los más pequeños para que el análisis crítico surja desde la literatura, desde la realidad, desde el entorno. Hay formas, eh, pedagogías, estrategias para comenzar. Creo que una cuestión central es romper la prescripción de currículos de, currículums de enseñanza demasiado eh, viejos o estru estructurados. Gracias. Um. Just to round off what Alicia mentioned, I would add that, I mean, expanding onto the linguistic access um, of teaching of a foreign language, that would be an improvement uh, into the reflection of the use. As, 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 I mean, moving from the user of the language into the educator, right, that teaches, in this case, English as a foreign language. And as I mentioned before, right, not only considering the learning access, but also the intercultural and also the one related to citizenship. If we, I mean, what we did, I mean, what we do in, in the English program in teacher education is to move across these three um, elements, these three access, right, into the teaching of English in, in, uh, in the teaching frame, I would say. Of course, we teach grammar, We teach uh, applied linguistics and uh, language and culture, but we move all across these three axes just to make this make room for this reflection to happen. Excellent, and we could and we could keep on going on for a very long time with this, but unfortunately, I think now we have to start um, bringing it home because we still have um, one, two more panel sessions coming in 10 minutes, and then of course. Um, the closing ceremony uh, that is coming at 7 p.m. Eastern, um, 4 p.m. Pacific. So I think everybody's invited. So we look forward to seeing you in the next two sessions, the session that is coming in about 10 minutes, and of course, the closing ceremony. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Robert. Thank you so much, Eugenia. Thank you so much, Yuya. 
And of course, the, uh, the great comments by Jennifer, Ash, uh, Nolan, Neil, and Alicia that trigger such beautiful and such enriching conversation. So uh, let's uh, continue learning together for, this, for the next couple of hours that we're still here. Uh, so I'll see you in the other rooms. Thank you, Raul. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You very Thank much. you so Thank much. You